The Philosophy of the Tao Zen Buddhism is a way and a view of life which does not belong to any of the formal categories of modern Western thought. It is not religion or philosophy. It is not a psychology or a type of science. It is an example of what is known in India and China as a way of liberation, and is similar in this respect to Taoism, Vedanta, and Yoga. As will soon be obvious, a way of liberation can have no positive definition. It has to be suggested by saying what it is not. Somewhat as a sculptor reveals an image by the act of removing pieces of stone from a block. Historically, Zen may be regarded as the fulfillment of long traditions of Indian and Chinese culture, though it is actually much more Chinese than Indian. And since the twelfth century, it has rooted itself deeply and most creatively in the culture of Japan. As the fruition of these great cultures, and as a unique and particularly instructive example of a way of liberation, Zen is one of the most precious gifts of Asia to the world. The origins of Zen are as much Taoist as Buddhist, and because its flavor is so peculiarly Chinese, it may be best to begin by inquiring into its Chinese ancestry, illustrating, at the same time, what is meant by a way of liberation, by the example of Taoism. Much of the difficulty and mystification which Zen presents to the Western student is the result of his unfamiliarity with Chinese ways of thinking ways which differ startlingly from our own, and which are, for that very reason, of special value to us in attaining a critical perspective upon our own ideas. The problem here is not simply one of mastering different ideas, differing from our own as, say, the theories of Kant differ from those of Descartes, or those of Calvinists from those of Catholics. The problem is to appreciate differences in the basic premises of thought and in the very methods of thinking, and these are so often overlooked that our interpretations of Chinese philosophy are apt to be a projection of characteristically Western ideas into Chinese terminology. This is the inevitable disadvantage of studying Asian philosophy by the purely literary methods of Western scholarship, for words can be communicative only between those who share similar experiences. This is not to go so far as to say that so rich and subtle a language as English is simply incapable of expressing Chinese ideas. On the contrary, it can say much more than has been believed possible by some Chinese and Japanese students of Zen and Taoism, whose familiarity with English leaves something to be desired. The difficulty is not so much in the language as in the thought patterns which have hitherto seemed inseparable from the academic and scientific way of approaching a subject. The unsuitability of these patterns for such subjects as Taoism and Zen is largely responsible for the impression that the Oriental mind is mysterious, irrational, and inscrutable. Furthermore, it need not be supposed that these matters are so peculiarly Chinese or Japanese that they have no point of contact with anything in our own culture. While it is true that none of the formal divisions of Western science and thought corresponds to a way of liberation, R. H. Blythe's marvelous study of Zen in the English literature has shown most clearly that the essential insights of Zen are universal. The reason why Taoism and Zen present at first sight such a puzzle to the Western mind is that we have taken a restricted view of human knowledge. For us, almost all knowledge is what a Taoist would call conventional knowledge, because we do not feel that we really know anything unless we can represent it to ourselves in words or in some other system of conventional signs, such as the notations of mathematics or music. Such knowledge is called conventional because it is a matter of social agreement as to the codes of communication, just as people speaking the same language have tacit agreements as to what words shall stand for what things, so the members of every society and every culture are united by bonds of communication resting upon all kinds of agreement as to the classification and valuation of actions and things. Thus the task of education is to make children fit to live in a society by persuading them to learn and accept its codes— the rules and conventions of communication whereby the society holds itself together. There is, first, the spoken language. 
The child is taught to accept tree and not boojum as the agreed sign for that, pointing to the object. We have no difficulty in understanding that the word tree is a matter of convention. What is much less obvious is that convention also governs the delineation of the thing to which the word is assigned. For the child has to be taught not only what words are to stand for what things, but also the way in which his culture has tacitly agreed to divide things from each other, to mark out the boundaries within our daily experience. Thus scientific convention decides whether an eel shall be a fish or a snake, and grammatical convention determines what experiences shall be called objects and what shall be called events or actions. How arbitrary such conventions may be can be seen from the question, What happens to my fist, noun, object, when I open my hand? The object mysteriously vanishes because an action was disguised by a part of speech usually assigned to a thing. In English, the differences between things and actions are clearly, if not always logically, distinguished. But a great number of Chinese words do duty for both nouns and verbs, so that one who thinks in Chinese has little difficulty in seeing that objects are also events, that our world is a collection of processes rather than entities. Besides language, the child has to accept many other forms of code. For the necessities of living together require agreement as to codes of law and ethics, of etiquette and art, of weights, measures, and numbers, and above all, of role. We have difficulty in communicating with each other unless we can identify ourselves in terms of roles, father, teacher, worker, artist, regular guy, gentleman, sportsman, and so forth. To the extent that we identify ourselves with these stereotypes and the rules of behavior associated with them, we ourselves feel that we are someone, because our fellows have less difficulty in accepting us, that is, in identifying us and feeling that we are under control. A meeting of two strangers at a party is always somewhat embarrassing when the host has not identified their roles in introducing them, for neither knows what rules of convention and action should be observed. Once again, it is easy to see the conventional character of roles, for a man who is a father may also be a doctor and an artist, as well as an employee and a brother. And it is obvious that even the sum total of these role labels will be far from supplying an adequate description of the man himself, even though it may place him in certain general classifications. But the conventions which govern human identity are more subtle and much less obvious than these. We learn, very thoroughly, though far less explicitly, to identify ourselves with an equally conventional view of myself. For the conventional self, or person, is composed mainly of a history consisting of selected memories, and beginning from the moment of parturition. According to convention, I am not simply what I am doing now. I am also what I have done, and my conventionally edited version of my past is made to seem almost more the real me than what I am at this moment. For what I am seems so fleeting and intangible, but what I was is fixed and final. It is the firm basis for predictions of what I will be in the future, and so it comes about that I am more closely identified with what no longer exists than with what actually is. It is important to recognize that the memories and past events which make up a man's historical identity are no more than a selection. From the actual infinitude of events and experiences, some have been picked out, abstracted, as significant, and this significance has, of course, been determined by conventional standards. For the very nature of conventional knowledge is that it is a system of abstractions. It consists of signs and symbols in which things and events are reduced to their general outlines, as the Chinese character Ren stands for man by being the utmost simplification and generalization of the human form. The same is true of words other than ideographs. The English words man, fish, star, flower, run, grow, all denote classes of objects or events which may be recognized as members of their class by very simple attributes, abstracted from the total complexity of the things themselves. 
Abstraction is thus almost a necessity for communication, since it enables us to represent our experiences with simple and rapidly made grasps of the mind. When we say that we can think only of one thing at a time, this is like saying that the Pacific Ocean cannot be swallowed at a gulp. It has to be taken in a cup and downed bit by bit. Abstractions and conventional signs are like the cup. They reduce experience to units simple enough to be comprehended one at a time. In a similar way, curves are measured by reducing them to a sequence of tiny straight lines, or by thinking of them in terms of the squares which they cross when plotted on graph paper. Other examples of the same process are the newspaper photograph and the transmission of television. In the former, a natural scene is reproduced in terms of light and heavy dots arranged in a screen or grid-like pattern so as to give the general impression of a black-and-white photograph when seen without a magnifying glass. Much as it may look like the original scene, it is only a reconstruction of the scene in terms of dots, somewhat as our conventional words and thoughts are reconstructions of experience in terms of abstract signs. Even more like the thought process, the television camera transmits a natural scene in terms of a linear series of impulses which may be passed along a wire. Thus, communication by conventional signs of this type gives us an abstract, one-at-a-time translation of a universe in which things are happening all together at once, a universe whose concrete reality always escapes perfect description in those abstract terms. The perfect description of a small particle of dust by these means would take everlasting time, since one would have to account for every point in its volume. The linear, one-at-a-time character of speech and thought is particularly noticeable in all languages using alphabets, representing experience in long strings of letters. It is not easy to say why we must communicate with others, speak, and with ourselves, think, by this one-at-a-time method. Life itself does not proceed in this cumbersome, linear fashion, and our own organisms could hardly live for a moment if they had to control themselves by taking thought of every breath, every beat of the heart, and every neural impulse. But if we are to find some explanation for this characteristic of thought, the sense of sight offers a suggestive analogy. For we have two types of vision, central and peripheral, not unlike the spotlight and the floodlight. Central vision is used for accurate work, like reading, in which our eyes are focused on one small area after another, like spotlights. Peripheral vision is less conscious, less bright than the intense ray of the spotlight. We use it for seeing at night, and for taking subconscious notice of objects and movements, not in the direct line of central vision. Unlike the spotlight, it can take in very many things at a time. There is, then, an analogy, and perhaps more than a mere analogy, between central vision and conscious, one-at-a-time thinking, and between peripheral vision and the rather mysterious process which enables us to regulate the incredible complexity of our bodies without thinking at all. It should be noted, further, that we call our bodies complex as a result of trying to understand them in terms of linear thought, of words and concepts. But the complexity is not so much in our bodies as in the task of trying to understand them by this means of thinking. It is like trying to make out the features of a large room with no other light than a single bright ray. It is as complicated as trying to drink water with a fork instead of a cup. In this respect, the Chinese written language has a slight advantage over our own, and is perhaps symptomatic of a different way of thinking. It is still linear, still a series of abstractions taken in one at a time, but its written signs are a little closer to life than spelled words because they are essentially pictures, and as a Chinese proverb puts it, one showing is worth a hundred sayings. Compare, for example, the ease of showing someone how to tie a complex knot with the difficulty of telling him how to do it in words alone. Now the general tendency of the Western mind is to feel that we do not really understand what we cannot represent, what we cannot communicate, by linear signs, by thinking. We are like the wallflower who cannot learn a dance unless someone draws him a diagram of the steps, who cannot get it by the feel. 
For some reason we do not trust and do not fully use the peripheral vision of our minds. We learn music, for example, by restricting the whole range of tone and rhythm to a notation of fixed tonal and rhythmic intervals, a notation which is incapable of representing Oriental music. But the Oriental musician has a rough notation which he uses only as a reminder of a melody. He learns music not by reading notes, but by listening to the performance of a teacher, getting the feel of it, and copying him. And this enables him to acquire rhythmic and tonal sophistications, matched only by those Western jazz artists who use the same approach. We are not suggesting that Westerners simply do not use the peripheral mind. Being human, we use it all the time, and every artist, every workman, every athlete calls into play some special development of its powers. But it is not academically and philosophically respectable. We have hardly begun to realize its possibilities, and it seldom, if ever, occurs to us that one of its most important uses is for that knowledge of reality which we try to attain by the cumbersome calculations of theology, metaphysics, and logical interference. When we turn to ancient Chinese society, we find two philosophical traditions playing complementary parts, Confucianism and Taoism. Generally speaking, the former concerns itself with the linguistic, ethical, legal, and ritual conventions which provide the society with its system of communication. Confucianism, in other words, preoccupies itself with conventional knowledge. And under its auspices, children are brought up so that their originally wayward and whimsical natures are made to fit the Procrustean bed of the social order. The individual defines himself and his place in society in terms of the Confucian formulae. Taoism, on the other hand, is generally a pursuit of older men, and especially men who are retiring from active life in the community. Their retirement from society is a kind of outward symbol of an inward liberation from the bounds of conventional patterns of thought and conduct. For Taoism concerns itself with unconventional knowledge, with the understanding of life directly, instead of in the abstract, linear terms of representational thinking. Confucianism presides, then, over the socially necessary task of forcing the original spontaneity of life into the rigid rules of convention a task which involves not only conflict and pain, but also the loss of that peculiar naturalness and unselfconsciousness for which little children are so much loved, and which is sometimes regained by saints and sages. The function of Taoism is to undo the inevitable damage of this discipline, and not only to restore, but also to develop the original spontaneity, which is termed zu ran, or self sowness for the spontaneity of a child is still childish, like everything else about him. His education fosters his rigidity, but not his spontaneity. In certain natures the conflict between social convention and repressed spontaneity is so violent that it manifests itself in crime, insanity, and neurosis, which are the prices we pay for the otherwise undoubted benefits of order. But Taoism must on no account be understood as a revolution against convention, although it has sometimes been used as a pretext for revolution. Taoism is a way of liberation which never comes by means of revolution, since it is notorious that most revolutions establish worse tyrannies than they destroy. To be free from convention is not to spurn it, but not to be deceived by it. It is to be able to use it as an instrument instead of being used by it. The West has no recognized institution corresponding to Taoism, because our Hebrew Christian spiritual tradition identifies the absolute God with the moral and logical order of convention. This might almost be called a major cultural catastrophe, because it weights the social order with excessive authority inviting just those revolutions against religion and tradition which have been so characteristic of Western history. It is one thing to feel oneself in conflict with socially sanctioned conventions, but quite another to feel at odds with the very root and ground of life, with the absolute itself. The latter feeling nurtures a sense of guilt so preposterous that it must issue either in denying one's own nature or in rejecting God. Because the first of these alternatives is ultimately impossible, like chewing off one's own teeth, 
the second becomes inevitable, where such palliatives as the confessional are no longer effective. As is the nature of revolutions, the revolution against God gives place to the worst tyranny of the absolutist state. Worse, because it cannot even forgive, and because it recognizes nothing outside the powers of its jurisdiction. For while the latter was theoretically true of God, his earthly representative, the Church, was always prepared to admit that though the laws of God were immutable, no one could presume to name the limits of his mercy. When the throne of the Absolute is left vacant, the relative usurps it and commits the real idolatry, the real indignity against God, the absolutizing of a concept, a conventional abstraction. But it is unlikely that the throne would have become vacant if, in a sense, it had not been so already, if the Western tradition had had some way of apprehending the Absolute directly, outside the terms of the conventional order. Of course, the very word absolute suggests to us something abstract and conceptual, such as pure being. Our very idea of spirit, as opposed to matter, seems to have more kinship with the abstract than the concrete. But with Taoism, as with other ways of liberation, the absolute must never be confused with the abstract. On the other hand, if we say that the Tao, as the ultimate reality is called, is the concrete rather than the abstract, this may lead to still other confusions. For we are accustomed to associate the concrete with the material, the physiological, the biological, and the natural, as distinct from the supernatural. But from the Taoist and Buddhist standpoints, these are still terms for conventional and abstract spheres of knowledge. Biology and physiology, for example, are types of knowledge which represent the real world in terms of their own special abstract categories. They measure and classify that world in ways appropriate to the particular uses they want to make of it, somewhat as a surveyor deals with earth in terms of acres, a contractor in truckloads or tons, and a soil analyst in types of chemical structures. To say that the concrete reality of the human organism is physiological is like saying that the earth is so many tons or acres. And to say that this reality is natural is accurate enough if we mean spontaneous, suran, or natura naturans, nature nurturing. But it is quite inaccurate if we mean natura naturata, nature natured. That is to say, nature classified, sorted into natures, as when we ask, what is the nature of this thing? It is in this sense of the word that we must think of scientific naturalism, a doctrine which has nothing in common with the naturalism of Taoism. Thus, to begin to understand what Taoism is about, we must at least be prepared to admit the possibility of some view of the world other than the conventional some knowledge other than the contents of our surface consciousness, which can apprehend reality only in the form of one abstraction, or thought, the Chinese nian, at a time. There is no real difficulty in this, for we will already admit that we know how to move our hands, how to make a decision, or how to breathe, even though we can hardly begin to explain how we do it in words. We know how to do it because we just do it. Taoism is an extension of this kind of knowledge, an extension which gives us a very different view of ourselves from that to which we are conventionally accustomed, and a view which liberates the human mind from its constricting identification with the abstract ego. According to tradition, the originator of Taoism, Lao Tzu, was an older contemporary of Kung Fu Tzu, or Confucius, who died in 479 B.C., Lao Tzu is said to have been the author of the Tao Te Ching, a short book of aphorisms setting forth the principles of the Tao and its power or virtue, De. But traditional Chinese philosophy ascribes both Taoism and Confucianism to a still earlier source, to a work which lies at the very foundation of Chinese thought and culture, dating anywhere from 3000 to 1200 B.C. This is the Yi Jing, or Book of Changes. The I Ching is ostensibly a book of divination. It consists of oracles based on sixty-four abstract figures, each of which is composed of six lines. The lines are of two kinds, divided, negative, and undivided, 
positive, and the six-line figures, or hexagrams, are believed to have been based on the various ways in which a tortoise shell will crack when heated. This refers to an ancient method of divination in which the soothsayer bored a hole in the back of a tortoise shell, heated it, and then foretold the future from the cracks in the shell so formed, much as palmists use the lines on the hand. Naturally, these cracks were most complicated, and the sixty-four hexagrams are supposed to be a simplified classification of the various patterns of cracks. For many centuries now the tortoise shell has fallen into disuse, and instead the hexagram appropriate to the moment in which a question is asked of the oracle is determined by the random division of a set of fifty yarrow stalks. But an expert in the I Ching need not necessarily use tortoise shells or yarrow stalks. He can see a hexagram in anything, in the chance arrangement of a bowl of flowers, in objects scattered upon a table, in the natural markings on a pebble. A modern psychologist will recognize in this something not unlike a Rorschach test, in which the psychological condition of a patient is diagnosed from the spontaneous images which he sees in a complex ink blot. Could the patient interpret his own projections upon the ink blot, he would have some useful information about himself for the guidance of his future conduct. In view of this, we cannot dismiss the divinatory art of the I Ching as mere superstition. Indeed, an exponent of the I Ching might give us quite a tough argument about the relative merits of our ways for making important decisions. We feel that we decide rationally because we base our decisions on collecting relevant data about the matter in hand. We do not depend upon such irrelevant trifles as the chance tossing of a coin, or the patterns of tea leaves, or cracks in a shell. Yet he might ask whether we really know what information is relevant, since our plans are constantly upset by utterly unforeseen incidents. He might ask how we know when we have collected enough information upon which to decide. If we were rigorously scientific in collecting information for our decisions, it would take us so long to collect the data that the time for action would have passed long before the work had been completed. So how do we know when we have enough? Does the information itself tell us that it is enough? On the contrary, we go through the motions of gathering the necessary information in a rational way, and then, just because of a hunch, or because we are tired of thinking, or because the time has come to decide, we act. He would ask whether this is not depending just as much upon irrelevant trifles as if we had been casting the yarrow stalks. In other words, the rigorously scientific method of predicting the future can be applied only in special cases, where prompt action is not urgent, where the factors involved are largely mechanical, or in circumstances so restricted as to be trivial. By far the larger part of our important decisions depend upon hunch, in other words, upon the peripheral vision of the mind. Thus the reliability of our decisions rests ultimately upon our ability to feel the situation, upon the degree to which this peripheral vision has been developed. Every exponent of the I Ching knows this. He knows that the book itself does not contain an exact science, but rather a useful tool which will work for him if he has a good intuition, or if, as he would say, he is in the Tao. Thus one does not consult the oracle without proper preparation, without going quietly and meticulously through the prescribed rituals in order to bring the mind into that calm state where the intuition is felt to act more effectively. It would seem, then, that if the origins of Taoism are to be found in the I Ching, they are not so much in the text of the book itself as in the way in which it was used, and in the assumptions underlying it. For experience in making decisions by intuition might well show that this peripheral aspect of the mind works best when we do not try to interfere with it, when we trust it to work by itself, zuran, spontaneously, self-so. Thus the basic principles of Taoism begin to unfold themselves. There is, first of all, the Tao, the indefinable, concrete process of the world, the way of life. The Chinese word means originally a way or road, and sometimes to speak, so that the first line of the Tao Te Ching contains a pun on the two meanings. The Tao, which can be spoken, 
is not eternal Tao. But in trying at least to suggest what he means, Lao Tzu says, There was something vague before heaven and earth arose. How calm! How void! It stands alone, unchanging. It acts everywhere, untiring. It may be considered the mother of everything under heaven. I do not know its name, but call it by the word Tao. And again, the Tao is something blurred and indistinct. How indistinct! How blurred! Yet within it are images. How blurred! How indistinct! Yet within it are things. How dim! How confused! Yet within it is mental power. Because this power is most true, within it there is confidence. Mental power is Jing, a word which combines the ideas of essential, subtle, psychic, or spiritual, and skillful. For the point seems to be that as one's own head looks like nothing to the eyes, yet is the source of intelligence, so the vague, void-seeming, and indefinable Tao is the intelligence which shapes the world with a skill beyond our understanding. The important difference between the Tao and the usual idea of God is that whereas God produces the world by making, way, the Tao produces it by not making, wu way, which is approximately what we mean by growing. For things made are separate parts put together, like machines or things fashioned from without, inwards, like sculptures. Whereas things grown divide themselves into parts, from within, outwards, because the natural universe works mainly according to the principles of growth, it would seem quite odd to the Chinese mind to ask it how it was made. If the universe were made, there would, of course, be someone who knows how it is made, who could explain how it was put together bit by bit, as a technician can explain in one-at-a-time words how to assemble a machine. But a universe which grows utterly— excludes the possibility of knowing how it grows in the clumsy terms of thought and language, so that no Taoist would dream of asking whether the Tao knows how it produces the universe. For it operates according to spontaneity, not according to plan. Lao Tzu says, The Tao's principle is spontaneity. But spontaneity is not by any means a blind, disorderly urge, a mere power of caprice. A philosophy restricted to the alternatives of conventional language has no way of conceiving an intelligence which does not work according to plan, according to a one-at-a-time order of thought. Yet the concrete evidence of such an intelligence is right to hand in our own thoughtlessly organized bodies. For the Tao does not know how it produces the universe, just as we do not know how we construct our brains. In the words of Lao Tzu's great successor, Zhuang Tzu, things are produced around us, but no one knows the whence. They issue forth, but no one sees the portal. Men, one and all, value that part of knowledge which is known. They do not know how to avail themselves of the unknown in order to reach knowledge. Is not this misguided? The conventional relationship of the knower to the known is often that of the controller to the controlled, and thus of lord to servant. Thus, whereas God is the master of the universe, since he knows about it all, he knows, he knows, the relationship of the Tao to what it produces is quite otherwise. The great Tao flows everywhere, to the left and to the right. All things depend upon it to exist, and it does not abandon them. To its accomplishments it lays no claim. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. In the usual Western conception, God is also self-knowing, transparent through and through to his own understanding, the image of what man would like to be, the conscious ruler and controller, the absolute dictator of his own mind and body. But in contrast with this, the Tao is through and through mysterious and dark, Xuan, as a Zen Buddhist said of it in later times, There is one thing. Above it supports heaven. Below it upholds earth. It is black like lacquer, always actively functioning. Xuan is, of course, a metaphorical darkness, not the darkness of night, of black as opposed to white, 
but the sheer inconceivability which confronts the mind when it tries to remember the time before birth or to penetrate its own depths. Western critics often poke fun at such nebulous views of the Absolute, deriding them as misty and mystical in contrast with their own robustly definite opinions. But as Lao Tzu said, When the superior man hears of the Tao, he does his best to practice it. When the middling man hears of the Tao, he sometimes keeps it and sometimes loses it. When the inferior man hears of the Tao, he will laugh aloud at it. If he did not laugh, it would not be the Tao. For it is really impossible to appreciate what is meant by the Tao without becoming, in a rather special sense, stupid. So as long as the conscious intellect is frantically trying to clutch the world in its net of abstractions and to insist that life be bound and fitted to its rigid categories, the mood of Taoism will remain incomprehensible and the intellect will wear itself out. The Tao is accessible only to the mind which can practice the simple and subtle art of Wu Wei, which, after the Tao, is the second important principle of Taoism. We saw that the I Ching had given the Chinese mind some experience in arriving at decisions spontaneously, decisions which were effective to the degree that one knows how to let one's mind alone, trusting it to work by itself. This is Wu Wei, since Wu means not or non, and Wei means action, making, doing, striving, straining, or busyness. To return to the illustration of eyesight, the peripheral vision works most effectively, as in the dark, when we see out of the corners of the eyes, and do not look at things directly. Similarly, when we need to see the details of a distant object, such as a clock, the eyes must be relaxed, not staring, not trying to see. So, too, no amount of working with the muscles of the mouth and tongue will enable us to taste our food more acutely. The eyes and the tongue must be trusted to do the work by themselves. But when we have learned to put excessive reliance upon central vision, upon the sharp spotlight of the eyes and mind, we cannot regain the powers of peripheral vision unless the sharp and staring kind of sight is first relaxed. The mental or psychological equivalent of this is the special kind of stupidity to which Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu so often refer. It is not simply calmness of mind, but non-graspingness of mind. In Chuang Tzu's words, The perfect man employs his mind as a mirror. It grasps nothing. It refuses nothing. It receives, but does not keep. One might almost say that it fuzzes itself a little, to compensate for too harsh a clarity. Thus Lao Tzu says of himself, Cut out cleverness, and there are no anxieties. People in general are so happy, as if enjoying a feast, or as if going up a tower in spring. I alone am tranquil, and have made no signs, like a baby who is yet unable to smile, forlorn as if I had no home to go to. Others all have more than enough, and I alone seem to be in want. Possibly mine is the mind of a fool, which is so ignorant. The vulgar are bright, and I alone seem to be dull. The vulgar are discriminative, and I alone seem to be blunt. I am negligent, as if being obscure, drifting, as if being attached to nothing. The people in general all have something to do, and I alone seem to be impractical and awkward. I alone am different from others. But I value seeking sustenance from the mother, Tao. In most Taoist writings, there is a slight degree of exaggeration or overstatement of the point which is actually a kind of humor, a self-caricature. Thus, Zhuang Tzu writes on the same theme, The man of character, Dei, lives at home without exercising his mind and performs actions without worry. The notions of right and wrong and the praise and blame of others do not disturb him. When within the four seas all people can enjoy themselves, that is happiness for him. Sorrowful in countenance, he looks like a baby who has lost his mother. Appearing stupid, he goes about like one who has lost his way. He has plenty of money to spend, but does not know where it comes from. He drinks and eats just enough, and does not know where the food comes from. 
Lao Tzu is still more forceful in his apparent condemnation of conventional cleverness. Cut out sagacity, discard knowingness, and the people will benefit an hundredfold. Cut out humanity, discard righteousness, and the people will regain love of their fellows. Cut out cleverness, discard the utilitarian, and there will be no thieves and robbers. Become unaffected, cherish sincerity, belittle the personal, reduce desires. The idea is not to reduce the human mind to a moronic vacuity, but to bring into play its innate and spontaneous intelligence by using it without forcing it. It is fundamental to both Taoist and Confucian thought that the natural man is to be trusted, and from their standpoint it appears that the Western mistrust of human nature, whether theological or technological, is a kind of schizophrenia. It would be impossible, in their view, to believe oneself innately evil without discrediting the very belief, since all the notions of a perverted mind would be perverted notions. However religiously emancipated, the technological mind shows that it has inherited the same division against itself when it tries to subject the whole human order to the control of conscious reason. It forgets that reason cannot be trusted if the brain cannot be trusted, since the power of reason depends upon organs that were grown by unconscious intelligence. The art of letting the mind alone is vividly described by another Taoist writer, Lie Tzu. Circa 398 B.C., celebrated for his mysterious power of being able to ride upon the wind. This, no doubt, refers to the peculiar sensation of walking on air, which arises when the mind is first liberated. It is said that when Professor D.T. Suzuki was once asked how it feels to have attained Satori, the Zen experience of awakening, he answered, Just like ordinary everyday experience, except about two inches off the ground. Thus, when asked to explain the art of riding on the wind, Lie Tzu gave the following account of his training under his master Lao Sheng. After I had served him, for the space of three years, my mind did not venture to reflect on right and wrong. My lips did not venture to speak of profit and loss. Then, for the first time, my master bestowed one glance upon me. And that was all. At the end of five years a change had taken place. My mind was reflecting on right and wrong, and my lips were speaking of profit and loss. Then, for the first time, my master relaxed his countenance and smiled. At the end of seven years there was another change. I let my mind reflect on what it would, but it no longer occupied itself with right and wrong. I let my lips utter whatsoever they pleased but they no longer spoke of profit and loss. Then at last my master led me in to sit on the mat beside him. At the end of nine years my mind gave free rein to its reflections, my mouth free passage to its speech. Of right and wrong, profit and loss, I had no knowledge, either as touching myself or others. Internal and external were blended into unity. After that there was no distinction between eye and ear, ear and nose, nose and mouth. All were the same. My mind was frozen, my body in dissolution, my flesh and bones all melted together. I was wholly unconscious of what my body was resting on, or what was under my feet. I was born this way and that, on the wind, like dry chaff or leaves falling from a tree. In fact, I knew not whether the wind was riding on me, or I on the wind. The state of consciousness described sounds not unlike being pleasantly drunk, though without the morning-after effects of alcohol. Zhuang Tzu noticed the similarity, for he wrote, A drunken man who falls out of a cart, though he may suffer, does not die. His bones are the same as other people's, but he meets the accident in a different way. His spirit is in a condition of security. He is not conscious of riding in the cart, neither is he conscious of falling out of it. Ideas of life, death, fear, etc. cannot penetrate his breast, so he does not suffer from contact with objective existences. And if such security is to be got from wine, how much more is it to be got from spontaneity? Since Lao Tzu, Zhuang Tzu, and Lie Tzu were all conscious enough to write very intelligible books, 
it may be assumed that some of this language is, again, exaggerated or metaphorical. Their unconsciousness is not coma, but what the exponents of Zen later signified by wu shin, literally, no mind, which is to say unselfconsciousness. It is a state of wholeness in which the mind functions freely and easily, without the sensation of a second mind or ego standing over it with a club. If the ordinary man is one who has to walk by lifting his legs with his hands, the Taoist is one who has learned to let the legs walk by themselves. Various passages in the Taoist writings suggest that no-mindedness is employing the whole mind as we use the eyes when we rest them upon various objects, but make no special effort to take anything in. According to Chuang Tzu, the baby looks at things all day without winking. That is because his eyes are not focused on any particular object. He goes without knowing where he is going and stops without knowing what he is doing. He merges himself with the surroundings and moves along with it. These are the principles of mental hygiene. And again, if you regulate your body and unify your attention, the harmony of heaven will come upon you. If you integrate your awareness and unify your thoughts, spirit will make its abode with you. Day, virtue, will clothe you, and the Tao will shelter you. Your eyes will be like those of a newborn calf, which seeks not the wherefore. Each of the other senses might similarly be used to illustrate the non-active functioning of the mind, listening without straining to hear, smelling without strong inhalation, tasting without screwing up the tongue, and touching without pressing the object. Each is a special instance of the mental function which works through all, and which Chinese designates with the peculiar word Xin. This term is so important for the understanding of Zen that some attempt must be made to say what Taoism and Chinese thought in general take it to mean. We usually translate it as mind or heart, but neither of these words is satisfactory. The original form of the ideograph seems to be a picture of the heart, or perhaps of the lungs, or the liver, and when a Chinese speaks of the shin, he will often point to the center of his chest, slightly lower than the heart. The difficulty with our translations is that mind is too intellectual, too cortical, and that heart, in its current English use, is too emotional, even sentimental. Furthermore, shin is not always used with quite the same sense. Sometimes it is used for an obstruction to be removed, as in wu shin, no mind. But sometimes it is used in a way that is almost synonymous with the Tao. This is especially found in Zen literature, which abounds with such phrases as original mind, ben shin, Buddha mind, fu shin, or faith in mind, shin shin. This apparent contradiction is resolved in the principle that the true mind is no mind, which is to say that the shin is true, is working properly, when it works as if it were not present. In the same way, the eyes are seeing properly when they do not see themselves, in terms of spots or blotches in the air. All in all, it would seem that shin means the totality of our psychic functioning, and more specifically the center of that functioning which is associated with the central point of the upper body. The Japanese form of the word, kokoro, is used with even more subtleties of meaning. But for the present, it is enough to realize that in translating it, mind, a sufficiently vague word, we do not mean exclusively the intellectual or thinking mind, nor even the surface consciousness. The important point is that according to both Taoism and Zen, the center of the mind's activity is not in the conscious thinking process, not in the ego. When a man has learned to let his mind alone, so that it functions in the integrated and spontaneous way that is natural to it, he begins to show the special kind of virtue or power called day. This is not virtue in the current sense of moral rectitude, but in the older sense of effectiveness, as one speaks of the healing virtues of a plant. Day is, furthermore, unaffected or spontaneous virtue, which cannot be cultivated or imitated by any deliberate method. Lao Tzu says, 
Superior day is not day, and thus has day. Inferior day does not let go of day, and thus is not day. Superior day is non-active, wu-wei, and aimless. Inferior day is active, and has an aim. The literal translation has a strength and depth which is lost in such paraphrases as superior virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue, and thus really is virtue. Inferior virtue cannot dispense with virtuosity, and thus is not virtue. When the Confucians prescribed a virtue which depended upon the artificial observance of rules and precepts, the Taoists pointed out that such virtue was conventional and not genuine. Zhuang Tzu made up the following imaginary dialogue between Confucius and Lao Tzu. Tell me, said Lao Tzu, in what consists charity and duty to one's neighbor? They consist, answered Confucius, in a capacity for rejoicing in all things, in universal love, without the element of self. These are the characteristics of charity and duty to one's neighbor. What stuff, cried Lao Tzu. Does not universal love contradict itself? Is not your elimination of self a positive manifestation of self? Sir, if you would cause the empire not to lose its source of nourishment, there is the universe. Its regularity is unceasing. There are the sun and moon. Their brightness is unceasing. There are the stars. Their groupings never change. There are the birds and beasts. They flock together without varying. There are trees and shrubs. They grow upwards without exception. Be like these. Follow Tao, and you will be perfect. Why then these vain struggles after charity and duty to one's neighbor, as though beating a drum in search of a fugitive? Alas, sir, you have brought much confusion into the mind of man. The Taoist critique of conventional virtue applied not only in the moral sphere, but also in the arts, crafts, and trades. According to Zhuang Tzu, Chui the artisan could draw circles with his hand better than with compasses. His fingers seemed to accommodate themselves so naturally to the thing he was working at that it was unnecessary to fix his attention. His mental faculties thus remained one, that is, integrated, and suffered no hindrance. To be unconscious of one's feet implies that the shoes are easy. To be unconscious of a waist implies that the girdle is easy. The intelligence of being unconscious of positive and negative implies that the heart, shin, is at ease. And he who, beginning with ease, is never not at ease, is unconscious of the ease of ease. Just as the artisan who had mastered day could do without the artificiality of the compass, so the painter, the musician, and the cook would have no need for the conventional classifications of their respective arts. Thus Lao Tzu said, The five colors will blind a man's sight. The five sounds will deaden a man's hearing. The five tastes will spoil a man's palate. Chasing and hunting will drive a man wild. Things hard to get will do harm to a man's conduct. Therefore the sage makes provision for the stomach and not for the eye. This must by no means be taken as an ascetic's hatred of sense experience, for the point is precisely that the eye's sensitivity to color is impaired by the fixed idea that there are just five true colors. There is an infinite continuity of shading, and breaking it down into divisions with names distracts the attention from its subtlety. This is why the sage makes provision for the stomach and not for the eye which is to say that he judges by the concrete content of the experience, and not by its conformity with purely theoretical standards. In sum, then, day is the unthinkable ingenuity and creative power of man's spontaneous and natural functioning, a power which is blocked when one tries to master it in terms of formal methods and techniques. It is like the centipede's skill in using a hundred legs at once, the centipede was happy, quite, until a toad in fun said, Pray, which leg goes after which? This worked his mind to such a pitch he lay distracted in a ditch, considering how to run. A profound regard for day underlies the entire higher culture of the Far East. 
so much so that it has been made the basic principle of every kind of art and craft. While it is true that these arts employ what are, to us, highly difficult technical disciplines, it is always recognized that they are instrumental and secondary, and that superior work has the quality of an accident. This is not a masterful mimicry of the accidental, an assumed spontaneity in which the careful planning does not show. It lies at a much deeper and more genuine level. For what the culture of Taoism and Zen proposes is that one might become the kind of person who, without intending it, is the source of marvelous accidents. Taoism is, then, the original Chinese way of liberation, which combined with Indian Mahayana Buddhism to produce Zen. It is a liberation from convention and of the creative power of day. Every attempt to describe and formulate it in words and one-at-a-time thought symbols must of necessity distort it. The foregoing chapter has perforce made it seem one of the vitalist or naturalistic philosophical alternatives. For Western philosophers are constantly bedeviled by the discovery that they cannot think outside certain well-worn ruts, that however hard they may try, their new philosophies turn out to be restatements of ancient positions, monist or pluralist, realist or nominalist, vitalist or mechanist. This is because they are the only alternatives which the conventions of thought can present, and they cannot discuss anything else without presenting it in their own terms. When we try to represent a third dimension upon a two-dimensional surface, it will of necessity seem to belong more or less to the two alternatives of length and breadth. In the words of Zhuang Zhu, were language adequate, it would take but a day fully to set forth Tao. Not being adequate, it takes that time to explain material existences. Tao is something beyond material existences. It cannot be conveyed either by words or by silence. <laughs>